this morning, oh, this morning, this evening, if, uh, boy, you can tell where I'm accustomed to. If you will, uh, turn with me to the second chapter of the book of Acts uh, tonight, if you will. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, mush, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them d divided tongues as of fire. Notice this one statement. And it says, And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you will, look down and find verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, which is only the third hour of the day. Let us pray. Father, we come to you tonight as we examine your words, and we ask, Lord, that you will allow uh, your Holy Spirit to settle in among us. We just ask, Lord, now that that Holy Spirit would speak to us as we gather, that it would draw us closer to you, and it would be used as an instrument, Father, to make us uh, work us for you and for the faith that we have. Help us to find courage to stand firm in our faith and to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for this service tonight. We just ask, Lord, now as we know your word tells us, we don't have to ask for that spirit to come. For it says where two or three are gathered, you're in our midst. So we're going to say thank you already for visiting with us. We just pray, Lord, now as you would just touch the mouth of this thy servant and allow him to speak words that only you would deliver. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Tonight, when we look at these few verses of Scripture, I want to share a few things with you. If you notice, uh, I don't have much of a theme. I've been preaching what God has laid on my heart. Uh, sometimes I can get caught up. I could very easily go pull four or five sermons and just preach them. But I have tried to let the Holy Spirit dwell in me to give you what I feel like the Spirit has led me. So tonight, I want us to look at the church. And if we know anything about the book of Acts, that's where the church got started. We know that that's where Peter preached, preached, and that's where 3,000 souls got saved, and that's where the church actually begun. So tonight when we look upon this, I want us to recognize that even though we won't reach the end of the book of Acts tonight, the book of Acts ends unending. The church is to continue to go out and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That is our mission in life. So tonight when we look at the Holy Spirit and we try to examine that a little bit and we try to figure out what happened in that upper room, some of you are probably already no nervous because you're probably figuring I'm expecting some of you to fall out in the floor. Maybe you're going to run the aisles. Well, if you take off running, run. Enjoy yourself. But I'm not expecting that. But I'm not you expecting you to be stone, wooden Indians either. God expects a little more out of his children than just that. Amen. So tonight when we examine this, I want to share with you what took place in that upper room. Jesus had gone on. He had died. He had told them, go and stay where I want you to be. Stay together to be in prayer because I must go. It's for your benefit that I go. For if I go, then the comforter can come. That's what's going to be a blessing to every believer is that comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. If you're the old King James Version, then that says the Holy Ghost. But it's all the same. But I want to share with you tonight is when we look at what happened in the upper room, recognize it said that it was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't a mighty wind. It sounded like a mighty wind. It's the same thing when they were together and they were all in prayer. 
when they gathered themselves together, the Holy Spirit fell in that place. It didn't fall out on the streets of Jerusalem. It fell in that upper room. It can fall in this crowd tonight. It can change every heart in here tonight and make us be servants for Christ. But who's going to answer that call? Are we going to have enough courage and say, Lord, send me? That's what he's requiring of every child. But tonight, I want to ask you all a question. What are we afraid of? Pointed a little bit different. What is it about church we are scared to death of? The Holy Spirit. Not all churches are. Most churches are. And I can say that because you can talk to me about Jesus and you feel very comfortable. You can tell me about God the Father, and He's in heaven, and you are very comfortable. You mention the Holy Spirit, and y'all are going to draw up in a knot. Because you're thinking, I'm going to be expecting something spectacular that's going to come from heaven to touch you, to make me think that you got something that I don't have. Not asking that. But we shouldn't be scared of what God has delivered to be a helper to you and I. But we are. We find ourselves living in a world where we're just scared to death to act like the church. <coughs> so I want to ask you, when most folks get saved, what happens? They come down, they repent of their sins, they tell the preacher they want to join the church, they, they want Jesus to write their name in the Lamb's Book of Life, they recognize they're a sinner, they need a Savior, and just ask him to please pray for me that the Lord will accept me. And make me a living sacrifice to go to work for him. That's what most of people pray. <clears throat> Excuse me. But tonight when we look at this, I want to share it with you from a different angle. Because when you come forward and you ask to be saved, most folks think, well, I want the Holy Spirit. But that's enough. I, I want him living in me. And I want him to help and guide and direct me. But that that's enough. Put the brakes on. I don't need nobody telling me what to do right there on the street. I don't want no encouragement about witnessing to somebody that I may come in contact with. The church is scared to death of that. And we've got to get past that. If we're going to make an impact on this world, we must obey the Holy Spirit. If we're going to be the church of Jesus Christ and we're going to love one another in this place, we've got to first of all learn to forgive one another. Love has to happen. Jesus has told us, and he told us on Sunday, that we're going to be known by being his followers. Why and how? By loving one another. When we come to this place, minus me, once I leave here tomorrow night, y'all come to church on Sunday morning with a smile on your face. Walk in that door without a care in the world. Leave everything out there in that parking lot. Walk in that door knowing you've had a great week of revival, knowing that you walk in that door don't make no difference whether you got your work clothes on when you get here. You walk in that door, put everything aside, and be glad you're in the house of God and that you're here to worship with one another. That's how we're going to know we're saved. That's how we're going to know we're children of God. And that's how we're going to know it's good to be together in the house of the Lord and to worship with one another. But we find one of the hatefulest things in the church, and that is to condemn one another in the church. That tears the church down. It doesn't build it up. That's the devil's work. So tonight when we look upon this Holy Spirit and how it dwells in us, we have to ask ourselves, well, why do we put the brakes on? Why are we afraid of the Holy Spirit? That's a question we all can answer, and it has to come from within you. But I just think one of the most amazing things is, is when we die. Whether it's the rapture and God calls us home or whether he raptures us one at a time and he raptures us to his heavenly home. It's going to be terrible to stand before the presence of almighty God and he stands there and he says, I gave you a gift. What did you do with it? You didn't even make it add to one more thing to it than when I give it to you. You didn't make it add 10 times. You didn't add it 20, 30, 50, or 100. You went and hid what you had and shared it with nobody. Now that ain't going to stop you from getting there, but that means to tell me that you have no purpose other than taking care of yourself and you're not worried about nobody. And God's called us to do something better than that. He's called us into service. So tonight, are we willing to be filled by the Holy Spirit? Most folks have a difficulty believing that once you get saved, they think, well, you just fool all the time. 
D.O. Moody, the great pastor in his day, he said that, yes, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, but he said, I got a leak. He said, I leak. In other words, he says there are days when he knows he needs the presence of God to be able to make it throughout the day. We have to ask for that refilling of the Holy Spirit very, very often. That's how we're going to survive in this world. We've got to be willing to count on Jesus. We can't walk through this world on our own power. And if you do, it's not going to last long. Your heart's going to be broken. Your day is going to fall apart. But who's going to pick you up? I, I copied something off of YouTube here the other day, and, and I should have wrote it down, and I didn't do it, and I'm not going to do it now. But it says, when you have a bad day and nobody's there to pick you up, you have to pick yourself up and carry on. And I thought, that's a lie right straight out of the pit of hell. Because if you depend on yourself sooner or later, you're going to fall apart. Depression's going to hit, and you're not going to know how to make it. So the only way we're going to make it is with Jesus Christ. Tonight, one of the things that has come to my attention is the church. Not, not this church, just the church. One of the things we lack the most in church is emotion. Now, I loved y'all singing a while ago, and if I'd known your choir was going to sing that song, I'd have told you to grab my choir and put them up there because they practicing that same song. Oh, yeah, they could have got up there and, boy, we could have had a joyful noise show sure enough. We, I, do it tomorrow night. How about that? All right. Y'all get to sing with them tomorrow night. But what I want to tell you is we are lacking emotion in the church. And you say, well, what about this emotion? People say, well, you shouldn't tell me how to feel in church. Well, you shouldn't come in that door with doom and gloom. Yes, your heart may be broken. Yes, you come into the right place. This is a hospital for sinners. This is a place for broken hearts to be healed. This is a place we come together for God to meet our needs. It's where we come to bow at an altar to be able to lift him up so when our prayers reach heaven, he reaches down to help us. But what happens? We don't have much emotion. We come in and we sit like wooden Indians. We don't want anything to happen. We don't want anybody to know things are happening in our life. We don't want anybody to know our life's falling apart. So we fight this thing called emotion. We find out that we want to just depend on ourselves and we don't want to show that we have much feelings. But in Mark chapter 5, in verse 29, we all know the story. The lady with the issue of blood. Now people will say, it doesn't, ma it doesn't mention emotions in the Bible. Well, I'm fixing to prove you wrong. That poor little lady has spent every dime she had to get well. She'd been to every doctor there was. Nobody helped this lady and could help her until the great physician healed her. And he didn't even know he healed her until she touched the hem of his garment. She got past all of this stuff that people were telling her. Yes, it, she was unclean. Yes, the Old Testament that said she was to stay away from everybody. But her only hope was Christ. She done heard about his miracles. She's done heard he could raise the dead. She heard he could cause the lamb to lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. She had done heard he could raise the dead. And if her Jesus that she had heard could do these things, he could heal her. So what happened? She battled her way through that crowd. She didn't care who she touched. She wanted to be clean. She wanted to be made whole. If it's a soul here tonight that you think you can't be saved, make your way down front. I guarantee you there's a Savior. His name is Jesus. He will wipe your sins clean. He will throw them into the deepest of the seas. It says he will cast them so far out as from the east as from the west, and those two shall not gather together ever again and make you whole. This poor little lady made her way to Jesus, and when she touched the hem of his garment, she didn't get a handful. She just touched him. Instantly she knew she was healed. More than that, Jesus says, who touched me? Now, you, you, now somebody with the Spirit can go off on that. Because somebody's in here has been touched. And they've been touched by the Holy Spirit because nobody else could do what Jesus had done. And it had to happen by him and through him. So we find out that when Jesus asked, who touched me? All those disciples said, Lord, everybody's around you. Everybody's touching you. He says, no, somebody touched me. 
Now, everybody's here tonight, and this message might not be but for one person, but if you need a touch of the Master's hand, it is here tonight. It is here for him to, him to come to meet your every need. He can take care of whatever's on your heart. He can take what, care of whatever your burden is. My Jesus is a God-saving Jesus. My Jesus is God in flesh. My Jesus came from heaven to set me free. My Jesus came to this earth, first of all, to be a savior of my soul. But he's coming the second time, King of kings, Lord of the lords. So you better get it right on this side because on the other side it's going to be hell to pay. So tonight, I want to share a little story with you. It's been told many, many years. If you've heard it, bear with me. But there was this preacher. He would go around to different churches and they would ask him to come preach revivals. And as he would go to preach his revivals, he would ask some of his deacons sometimes, he said, would you go with me, be company with me? Would you just follow along with me and just sit in the crowd? So he got one of his deacons to one night. He was going to a new church, and it was the first night to preach. It wasn't at Blessed Hope. I'm just picking. But he showed up at the church. They walked in, and when he got there, they were just beginning to turn the lights on. He walked in, and people began to come in, and nobody spoke to nobody. Or to anybody. Cold, dead, dry church. They went through the motions. Followed the deacons. I mean, followed the bulletin. And that little deacon was sitting in there watching his pastor. All of this was taking place. And he preached his heart out. And the only amen and the hallelujah and glory be to God come from that little deacon that went with that preacher that night. The preacher was so upset that after the service he got in the car and him and his deacon was on the way home. He said, he said, brother, a dead church needs to be buried. He said, how in the world did you find it in yourself to praise the Lord with a bunch of dead, dry, cold folks? That deacon looked at him and he said, well, pastor, I'm going to tell you just like it is. He said, I prayed up before you ever picked me up. My cup was already full. He said, when I sat down in that congregation, the Lord began to drop drops of rain. He said, and every time one would fall in my cup, it overflowed. Amen. So when we get in God's house, don't hold back on the amens. Don't hold back on praising the Lord. The God Almighty who saved you, who raised you up out of the ditch, who set your feet on solid ground. Ladies and gentlemen, the night I got saved, I ain't never been the same no more. I don't know about you, but I was in that gutter. I know what it is to live that kind of life. My mama don't know what I lived as a child. Thank God she don't, but I don't want to live them days no more. But Jesus Christ set me free, and I don't have to look back on that life ever again. If you live that kind of life, he can set you free. So tonight, I want you to think back. You can close your eyes if you'd like. So ain't nobody looking at nobody. Go back in the files in your mind. Think back to the time you lived before you met Christ. Now I'm not saying dig up your past. But just remember. Now I want you to think forward to the day you got saved. I want you to be able to picture in your mind those two things. The life you lived before and the life you lived after you got saved. That's what needs to happen. Because I am convinced, you can open your eyes if you haven't closed. I am convinced that when you got saved, your house got shaken. The Holy Spirit settled in in your house. He might have broke your heart and break you down. He might have brought you to a point in your life that you had reached rock bottom and there won't but one way up. But he met you wherever you were, and he saved your soul. 
Now, I can tell you, I've seen people that their knees knocked so bad they couldn't hardly stand up. I've seen people weep to the point they could not hold their eyes open and they just bawled like children. I've seen people sit down now and they just get tore all to pieces and can't mumble a word other than, Lord, save me. I don't know how you acted, but if that happened to you, that is just like what happened in the upper room. The Holy Spirit has failed on you and has caused you to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. So you know what happened. It won't a gas pain in your stomach. It was Jesus Christ who had sat down upon you and let you know that you have been saved. <clears throat> so tonight, you have to ask yourself, do you believe the scripture where it says, Whom the Son sets free, you're free indeed? I believe that with all my heart. But you see, I also know something. There are some Christians, and I've heard this not to my face, but I've heard this in people talk. I've seen people get saved, and they get on fire for the Lord. And I've heard one standing around the corner, and they didn't know I could hear now, folks, I don't have the best eyesight in the world, but I got real good hearing. And what I mean by that is, I've seen people get on fire for the Lord, and I've heard heathens stand outside the church door and say, give them two or three weeks. That, that, that feeling will go away. You dead gum right, it'll go away. Cold-hearted, bone-dry, dead churches will allow somebody like that that got touched to just die and dry. A church that's dead, dry bones ought to bury that heifer. Dig a hole and put it in it. If God wants it revived, they better revive it. But if not, bury it. Because we're at a point today, ladies and gentlemen, the church needs to get on fire. And I can tell you this. And I heard this from a preacher seven years ago because I let him use my pulpit to preach a trial sermon. And I never forgot what he said. He told that day, he said, you want to draw a crowd? Build a fire and people will come watch it burn. And I never forgot that. And I thought, well, it, and I ain't going now. But I'm just going to tell you this. He made the analogy that day. He said he went home and he thought his house was on fire. It was his neighbor's house. He and his wife couldn't get down for three or four city blocks. He parked his car. They walked because it was, they were afraid it was their home. And it was so many cars and so many people who had gathered to come watch that house burn. He said he was convinced that if you build a fire in the pulpit, people will come watch it burn. And if they don't come watch it burn, I don't know if there's any hope for them. Because I know scripture says that if you get to a point in your life that you deny Christ long enough, he will seal you with a hot iron. He will give you a reprobate mind, and that just means he's washed his hands of you. Because when you get that dull and that hard-hearted and that cold, God hadn't turned his back on you. You have turned your back on him. So tonight, Jesus died. Why? So we could live. So many people tell me, said, you know, I, I, I might we get saved, but I don't think I could live up to it. You can't live up to it. You rely on the Holy Ghost. That's how you make it. And that's what most folks don't understand. They think, well, I know I need to get saved, but I can't live that lifestyle. And then some of them get afraid, get afraid and they say, well, if I get saved, I, I might have to give my life. I might, get, I might get killed. I might be one of those they chop my head off. Jesus didn't die for you. To, Jesus didn't die for us to die. Jesus died so we may live. Now, that, does that mean we may suffer a martyr's death? It sure does. How many people do you know personally has given their life for Jesus Christ because they witnessed on his behalf here in this country? None. Not yet. It's coming. Amen. Share with you a few more scriptures. Same chapter, but if you will find verse 17, if you'd like to read it with me. It says, and it shall come to pass, this is Peter talking. That the last days the Son of God, that he will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. They shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and on signs in the earth beneath. Blood, fire, and smoke, and vapors of smoke. 
The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pentecost started when the Holy Spirit was delivered in the upper room. The last day started the same day. 2,000 years has passed. Christ hadn't come yet, has he? And a lot of people says it's not going to happen. A thought came to me today. Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, and there were those singing Hosanna. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. And those old Pharisees went to Jesus and said, Would you tell them? Would you rebuke them and tell them to shut up? Be quiet. Jesus says, if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks are going to cry out. We've got churches today that are too quiet. The world is trying to silence the church. They want it to shut up. They want it to be quiet. They want us to rebuke the rest of the Christians so we don't tell the gospel to anybody. You want to know what's going on in the world today? Washington, D.C. is having a fit that they can't shut the church up. We've got to stand our ground. Not over some shot. Get over the shot. It's over Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. We've lost the big picture because all we focus on is somebody recognizing or thinking that we're going to get uh, the 666 um, uh, mark of the beast placed on us. That has nothing to do with it. I want to share with you tonight, don't worry about the mark of the beast. We're about getting your heart right. We're in about sa serving the Savior. We're in about getting saved. Making sure that there's no doubt in your life that when you leave here tonight, if you, if you die, I can preach your sermon, our uh, funeral, Brother Donnie Ken, Brother Ronnie Ken. Somebody can have your service and rejoice because they know where you are. The greatest thing in all the earth is to know that your loved one is in heaven. I thought about it one time. You know, a, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, correct? All right. Put all that into perspective. Now, I hadn't broken it down. I'm no mathematician, but I could figure they would give me enough paper. But I'm just telling you, by the time we get to heaven, those who have gone on before us that have been dead 20 and 30 years, technically they've even gone five minutes. We sit down here and weep because we think, Lord have mercy, they've been dead so long. And when we get to heaven, I can see my dead and I, well, well, son, where you been? You're late. Because he was already 20 minutes early, and if you won't like him, you was already late. So that, that's the way it is when you look at it in the grand scheme of things with Christ. But we can't play the numbers game thinking that there's another thousand years just because 2,000 years has passed. We are on the third day. That's what's most important. So tonight, I ask you, do you want to be a dead church or a live church? Amen. We want to serve the living Christ. We want folks to know that the one who lives in us is alive and well. He's not dead. That's what gives us life. That's what gives us the uh, fortitude to be able to face tomorrow. Because we know he lives. And he lives in us. But I think back to those rocks. I'm going to use rocks as symbolism. Jesus says if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks are going to cry out. The rocks are crying out. Wars and rumors of wars are happening. People are being martyred all around the world. But folks, I want you to know that he is causing earthquakes. He's causing tsunamis. He's causing hurricanes. He's causing everything that can happen. It's divisions within the family. Why? It's over the word of God. He's causing divisions in the church over the word of God. And we have to make our minds up. Who are we going to serve? You see, I've come to this point in my life, I have to ask myself, am I going to be dignified and serve the Lord like you tell me to serve him, or am I going to serve him the way this book tells me to serve him? That's what it all counts. That's why we can't enjoy a church. 
Man's done taught us how to pray. Man's done taught us how to worship. So if we come in here, somebody falls on their knees and goes to praying, somebody thinks, well, that brother's got a problem, and most folks don't know it, and they go run and tell somebody. He's at the ABC store when, you know, on an off hour when nobody knows nothing about it. Or she's down there running around with my neighbor, and she thinks nobody knows about it. That's the kind of stuff that goes on in the church when we need to be praying for whoever's down here to meet whatever their need is. We need to get back to the basics, ladies and gentlemen. It's the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. And the rest of them you can throw in the trash. We got to get our life right, and it has to be by this book. And Jesus has told us in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he says, Therefore go and thout throughout all the world, to all the nations, preaching the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He has given us that commission. He even gives us a promise. He says, for I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So where are we? We're sitting at a point we have to decide if we're going to obey man or we're going to obey God. Tonight we have to make that choice. Or we're going to Start coming to church with a smile on our face because nobody can take that off except the devil uses us to tear somebody down. We are a family of God lifting one another up. That is what we are called to do. Great and mighty things will happen when we trust in God. Let us pray. Father, we come to you tonight and I just ask, Lord, that you would just move in our midst. I just ask, Lord, that you would just touch us and draw us to your throne of grace. Whatever our needs are, Lord, you are need-meeting God. Whatever we face, whether it's problems at work, whether it's problems at home, whether it's somebody who's a drug addict or drunk, whether it's somebody who has family trouble, who knows what it is, but you know. If you can heal a woman with an issue of blood, and you can tell a woman that's at the well who shouldn't be there and shouldn't be giving water to a, a Jew. We know, Lord, you told her everything about her life. We know you know it all, so we just ask that you just meet our needs. May we just have enough courage to come and tell you what those needs are. Help us as brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for all those that will come. For it's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.